I'd like to introduce Ian Fitzgerald, uh, who's going to chat to you uh, about liberating capability in the public service. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, my, uh, Robert told me this morning that he uh, wouldn't be here for this session, so I did put it down to a case of nerves on his part. Um, but uh, last year I had the opportunity to debate my other brother, Stephen, at the Ames Great Debate, and, uh, and uh, you'll be pleased to know I won. We are quite a competitive family, so um, we'll, uh, we'll see what Rob says if he does get here uh, later on. But um, thanks for the invitation to speak today and hopefully spark a bit of a conversation um, about the broader questions of how organisations can liberate the capability of, uh, of their people. And, uh, and secondly, I'll talk a bit about what the public service is doing, uh, the Australian public service is doing in, in this space as well. So um, just as, as, as background, uh, I've got the role of Chief Human Capital Officer uh, in the public service, and, and what that means is it's really about the strategic foresight capacity um, in the leadership space. It's about uh, thinking about, what, about things like what comes the, down the line for Australia over the next 10 to 20 years. This is all with colleagues across the service, of course, and uh, what could that mean for citizens, the community and the nation? And given that, what are the capabilities that we need in the Australian public service to respond well to those opportunities and uh, those opportunities and challenges? Um, I don't go to the policy implications, that's for others. My area is capability, and that's leadership capability, workforce capability, and agency capability. Um, to me, liberating capability is essentially about uh, creating the right conditions within an organisation to engage the expertise of people and support them to work to their full uh, potential. That sounds really kind of simple. Um, unfortunately, it's actually really hard. But the benefits of doing that are an increased chance that an organisation is focusing um, on the right issues by using the collective strategic foresight capacity of, of its uh, people, that's uh, everyone in the organisation, to scan the environment. Um, secondly, it's, uh, it's got benefits for individuals and the quality of the talent that you can attract to an organisation. There's an engagement benefit um, in people feeling they're uh, uh, part of a, a, bigger, uh, a bigger problem in terms of the scanning the environment and helping with some of the uh, solutions. So, uh, in engagement, as people will know, if you're engaged in your work, you're more likely to exercise your discretionary effort. You're more likely to do those extra things, uh, which is a, has a productivity benefit for an organisation. Um, so they're some of the reasons um, uh, we do that. But, um, you know, for, again, for the organisation, though, it's about thinking about uh, not just how do we do the things better that we're doing today, but how do we anticipate some of the challenges and opportunities we'll face in the future and prepare ourselves to respond uh, more strategically. So I guess you could ask, why do we need to think about this in the Australian Public Service? And, uh, and, a, and a really good reason is because the environment that we're working in is changing um, and has continued to change ever since the service was set up 110 years ago. Um, the, but the levels of uncertainty in the world today are unlike that of previous periods. The economic, social, environmental, technological, you get it, you, know, so you, you would be thinking about these things. Um, they're increasingly intertwined and they're increasingly uh, on, a, on a, um, a, a more complex and, and the scale is increasing of some of the issues that we need to deal with. Um, not the least of which is because we have a, a surging population in the world and uh, you look at uh, that period between 1800 and, and about 1922, so 120 years or so, that's how long it took to add 2 billion people to the world. Um, basically, we'll have another 2 billion people in the world in the next uh, 30 or 40 years. And I heard estimates of 10 billion um, this morning um, as well. But, you know, we, we have to deal with a fairly substantial uh, change in population in a relatively um, short period of time, and that will create unfamiliar uh, problems uh, and, and, you know, op opportunities as well as we're a little, little closer together. So um, just to make it a little bit more personable, this is Danica. She was the seven billionth child uh, in the world last year. I don't exactly know how they worked that out. Um, but it just puts a human face on this. We've, we've got another two billion people to feed and, and look after in the next um, 30 or 40 years. And uh, that's a significant uh, challenge. So my point in saying this is that we can't assume that what got us to this point um, is going to get us, uh, uh, help us deal with the issues of the next, um, next few decades. The problems we solved or, so need to solve are of a different order of magnitude. 
And uh, as I say, we're all getting a little closer and we're all getting a little bit more connected in what we uh, do. And I missed John's speech earlier and I'm sure, um, I'm sure he was talking all about uh, that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, all right. Um, so the threshold question for the Australian Public Service is, uh, is whether we have the capability to deal with the issues that lie ahead. Not only those that we can reasonably foresee, we can reasonably foresee uh, an ageing population and the implications of an ageing population, but there's some other things that we need to prepare for which may come down the line as, um, as shocks on occasions. So as I said, we think about capability in that context. Just a little bit of history. It's important to say that the public service has always um, dealt with uh, varying degrees of complexity and change. Those people who were around at the time, you know, with global world wars would say they were fairly complex periods. It's certainly true, um, but, uh, but what I'm talking about is a systemic change uh, uh, in terms of what we need to deal with and just the number of issues coming down the line at once um, add, to the, add a couple of degrees of complexity. But one of the things I do is prepare the State of the Service Report, and which, as the name suggests, it's an annual assessment of the state of the Australian Public Service, whether we're fit for purpose, essentially, uh, to meet the needs of the government today and future governments. And in doing that, I've had the opportunity to read uh, some of the earliest of those reports. Um, so back to the sort of you know, early last century, 110 plus years ago. And there is a story of continuity and change. And the continuity is really about our values, the things that we hold quite dear in the public service. Um, uh, our values are essentially unchanged since uh, 1 January 1901, um, in, and uh, we hold them dear today. Our apolitical nature, for example, being fit to serve today's government, a future government as well, holding those two notions uh, in the head at the same time, acting with integrity at all times, and the, just how essential it is to earn and maintain the trust of the Australian people. And, uh, um, and, and I'm, you know, I'm talking about our, our public service institution in terms of, you know, we exercise the co coercive powers of the state, we raise taxes, um, we can only do that if we've got the trust and confidence of the Australian people, and I only have to ask you to look at some countries overseas that don't have that, and it doesn't, uh, it doesn't work out well in the long run. But um, our first commissioner, Commissioner McLaughlin, said, he, for example, and these are his words, efficiency and economy must be the watchwords of the, this service if public confidence is to be attained and maintained. And as I say, all of those notions uh, around uh, integrity and our values remain as true today as they were then. And we've always dealt with technological change. It's just that some of the nature of the problems we're solving uh, um, are different. Um, for example, in 1904, the then commissioner became frustrated by what he saw as the overuse of telegraph operators. Um, Basically, people were using, sending telegraphs, this is in Melbourne at that time, sending telegraphs between um, offices which were essentially co-located. And uh, so his idea, his big innovation at the time, was to set up a system of pneumatic tubes through which messages would be thrown, or, or vacuum kind of, kind of pumped, I guess, and backed up by a series of runners. And, uh, and he said it might cost some money up front, but in, the, in due course it will uh, it'll pay off. So, you know, we've always been innovative. Um, to some degree. Uh, some of our technological issues might be a little bit more complex, but uh, the thinking was definitely there. And I'm told that some of these things actually existed in our buildings here in Canberra until quite some pe seeing people nodding. <laughs> nodding. So, you know, technology is, um, it moves on. What I loved was his other line in the report, though. He said, effectively, he was saying, why are people sending all these messages? Couldn't they just pick up the phone? So, you know, some, some things are a, a bit timeless, I think. Um, in terms of that's 110 years ago. Um, and of course the public service has gone through periods of technological change and innovation and at different stages in history it takes different forms and, and different ways. In 1954 the punch card machinery was introduced in the Victorian branch of um, Social Security to handle child endowment claims more efficiently. Early desktop computers, my commissioner says that when he started in the public service in the early 1970s, um, uh, basically, these things hadn't been introduced yet, and uh, he was lucky, lucky as a lowly policy officer to get access to a typewriter. You know, so it was a different world and a different, completely different way of working and a different way of thinking about um, innovation. So I guess it's a fair question to ask whether we, our systems, our structures, our processes are fit for service today. Do the things that worked well in the 20th century, are they still the things that are going to work well in the 21st century, 
And a few years ago, there was a significant report produced. This report got ahead of the game, and it was a review of just those questions. And the review concluded that we need a more forward-looking... Well, first of all, the review concluded the public service is not broken. We, we do compare well in Australia to our, our comparators' uh, um, benchmarks overseas. Um, but uh, there was a strong sense that we could do more and we could be better and we could have a better culture for, of continuous improvement. And to do that, we needed to be more uh, forward-looking. Uh, forward and in addition to that, I think that we've done a lot of it then and since and with colleagues and with the CSIRO and with others, just about that longer-term environment, the strategic foresight capacity of the Australian public service and how we create more conversations across boundaries about what's coming down the line, what it could mean and the capabilities we need um, to respond. And a really good way to go into the theme of today, a really good way to scan that external environment is if every single person in the organisation is equipped to be a part of that process, to be alert to the uh, perhaps weak signals out there, but things that might matter um, not just within your own area of work but more generally and the connections that might need uh, to be made. So a tightly held bureaucracy is good for ensuring that people aren't hungry, so distributing benefits throughout a system, uh, uh, that's, that's fine. Um, and it works well in an environment where the solutions are technical and the conditions are stable and fairly um, predictable. Um, but more distributed and adaptable organisations are required if the environment is more fluid, dynamic and complex. And, uh, I'd uh, argue that uh, that's the kind of environment we're in and that's increasingly the kind of environment um, that we're moving into. So I'll just talk for a few minutes about the nature of some of the things in the external environment that um, you know, different groups of us at different times uh, uh, think about. Um, some are a bit, uh, a bit left field uh, perhaps, but it's really intended just to, probably not for you guys actually, it's probably not left field for you guys, but, uh, but we do need to think in the areas of science and technological change, um, our place in Asia, um, our place in the world, and we need to think about some demographic um, uh, issues that uh, are uh, in, in place in Australia. And then I'll come back to our capacity to respond. So I am, given the audience and the place um, that we're in uh, now, um, going to assume that we're on the same page in terms of the breathtaking pace of technological change, um, and the potential of that to both create new problems for us, um, but also to solve them, and some of those problems are in the realm of science fiction or, or were not that, not that long ago. But as our chief scientist, Professor Ian Chubb said, science, technology, engineering and mathematics uh, will all play an important part in finding the solutions uh, needed to ensure health, security, safety um, for our nation and for our planet. And of course everything is converging, digital, biological, social and environmental. So degrees of difficulty here. I mean mapping the human genome. Um, has the potential to transform, obviously, the prevention and treatment of disease, um, and it's got for the public service and policy and service delivery implications, which de people uh, definitely are, are thinking about. Um, but those same gene technologies are also relevant to strategies to increase um, crop production, to feed those two billion more people I, I mentioned, and obviously CSRO and others do a lot of work in, in that space. But uh, we have to increase food production by sort of 50 to 70 percent um, in the next uh, few decades and uh, with essentially no more arable land to do that with. So we have a, we've had a green revolution in the past where we doubled food production through the application of some uh, particular technologies and approaches. We have a different set of tools that we'll need to source to, so to solve this uh, problem in the future. And that's really the point uh, I'm making. If the conditions change, then as a public service, we need to think differently. Um, this 3D printing. Now, um, uh, President Obama said in his most recent State of the Union address that uh, 3D printing has the potential to revolutionise the way we make almost everything. So, you know, uh, I do... Um, Rob's got one upstairs, actually, 3D printer, so uh, I'm not sure that he's revolutionising the way we make almost everything, but he does have one um, upstairs. Um, our, pol our top graduates are all, over, are all over this, so if I do a, a foresight session with some of our top grads, uh, they'll say, what does the digitisation of manufacturing mean for the future of transport in this country? They've got no idea how to, you know, turn that into something useful, but they've got some really, really big ideas. Um, and it, that, that, that's the kind of thinking we need to stimulate in lots and lots of areas. And it's, uh, with, with this month I'm doing a whole lot of session with grads 
um, around the future of work. And it's absolutely brilliant um, hearing their thinking of the future of work because it's their future. Um, so uh, uh, that's, uh, that's important work. Um, uh, just going back to the 3D printing, I did see today that Cornell University researchers are working out ways to print body parts at the moment. So, um, so hopefully that's not what Rob's doing with his uh, machines upstairs, but uh, who knows. And driverless cars, it sounds a bit left field, um, but they're really just essentially very, very mobile um, devices and companies like Google and other companies. What they're interested in is the operating system. How do we get the operating system to make th these things work? And, uh, and the, the, the other one I'll mention is the, uh, in technology space is, um, this was on the 1st of April, and when I started reading, I was thinking, hang on, is this a joke? Um, uh, April Fool's Day, but it was our Civil Aviation Authority. And what they were grappling with was this rise of civil and commercial drones um, and the implications, because they're not just safety issues, there's privacy issues that come with, with that. And uh, so that's what they were, were, were grappling with. And interestingly, the US Federal Aviation Administration said, uh, says that by 2020, there'll be 15,000 of these things in the air in the US. And by 2030, there'll be 30,000 of these things in the air. And they've got no idea how to really how to regulate them. How to, so, yep. There you go. So delivering pizzas. Um, yep, absolutely. Yeah, it's tip of the iceberg stuff, isn't it, in terms of how they might be used. But it's uh, interesting. Um, anyway, one of the many, many things that we probably need to think about. Um, and of course, we'll all be looked after robots when we get old. As, um, and they're, they're, they're talking about this in Japan right now, because by 20, I'm um, seeing some people nodding. Um, by 2050, in Japan, there'll be one person working for every person aged over 65. So we're talking seriously. They did a poll of the acceptability of being looked after by a robot um, in, uh, in old age. So anyway, that's our, um, that's our future. But let me, um, let me turn to Asia. Uh, there was a recent white paper, as probably many of you know, um, that looking at Australia and its place in Asia, looking at the international and the domestic implications. Of, uh, of, of some of those changes. Um, it really called on Australian institutions to respond uh, positively uh, to, to that. And, uh, but certainly the growth of middle class in Asia is predicted to have significant uh, implications for um, Australia and structural implications for our um, economy. Although really important to say it's not just about the economy, the social implications, the, um, the cultural implications. And uh, given the theme today, just the potential source of innovation that comes with um, uh, our ability to, to work well with our, um, uh, our you know, um, counterparts uh, across Asia and other parts of the world. And finally, I'll just mention demographic change. Um, you know, obviously our, our diversity is, is increasing in Australia. So Chinese born people um, are the most significant source of overseas um, uh, migrants for Sydney. And for uh, Melbourne, it's people born in India, as the, now the used to be people from Europe. Um, so our society is changing as we adapt to our place uh, in Asia, for example. And actually in Brisbane, it's New Zealanders are the main, um, the main uh, uh, migrant groups. But uh, anyway, but staying with demographic issues, uh, I'm sure you all know we have an ageing um, population and it's, uh, it's going to create quite a few um, um, issues for us and it is one of those issues we actually know and understand quite well and it's been well explored by the Treasury in the intergenerational reports but quite simply um, we have about five people working today for every person aged over 65 and uh, we'll have about 2.7 people working for every person aged over 65 by 2050 so that's a significant productivity challenge or a significant participation challenge or it's a population um, issue uh, for us. Um, and if we do nothing, uh, we're, we're going to see rising health and benefit costs um, whilst uh, at, against a backdrop of a shrinking tax base, essentially. So it's something we'd certainly need to, to think about. Uh, the other area, of course, social networking and social media is something that the public service uh, is grappling with, um, needs to grapple with, and is grappling with. Um, but I read a report last week of the National Intelligence Council from the US uh, forecasting that um, power will be shifting to networks and coalitions and individual empowerment will increase as the middle class grows, particularly in Asia. Um, and that's a group of US uh, top kind of US thinkers. But importantly, what the report questions is, will governments and institutions be able to adapt fast enough to harness change instead of being overwhelmed? So 
I'm going to stop there. I could have picked any set of issues. They're just to say that our environment is changing. I'm, I'm hopefully, uh, hopefully you agree and will continue to change in quite significant ways. The implication of that is we all have a role um, as citizens, I would argue, in being interested in this, these kinds of changes, but particularly in the Australian public service. I'm a taxpayer too. I would expect my Australian public servants in particular to have a long-term view of what matters, of what's coming down the line, why it matters, and, uh, and to be thinking uh, about having the capability to respond well. And uh, what I'm going to do now is just use some data that we have that we use to inform the state of the service report. So that's the assessment of the, uh, where the public service is at at any one time. So, uh, so two instruments are used to inform that report and, and lots of others, but two in particular. One is an agency survey where we get feedback on critical questions from all two, couple, two minutes. Four minutes, so that's going to be interesting. Um, let me just tell you that, um, that it in, basically the report says that, uh, that agency heads recognise a significant increase in the need to scan the environment to be forward looking and uh, to be more strategic and respond to business drivers. Um, not necessarily some of those things I said, but in general, uh, the future from their perspective is that we need to scan the horizon and be more uh, forward looking. And an implication of all of this, given we're going to have a shrinking. Uh, resource bases, reprioritisation will be critical. In terms of employees on innovation, just to let you know, half said, and this is a survey of 87,000, a census by the way, uh, we had 87,000 responses, about half had implemented an innovative change in the last year, 50% in service delivery as you can see, and, and about half said that's true but there are barriers to innovation in the Australian public service and some of those barriers were they didn't think their managers would take it seriously, resistance from colleagues, or unwillingness of managers to take risks, or at least perceived unwillingness. So we are doing it. There's lots of innovation happening, but there are some barriers. In addition to that, um, employees said from that group that we need to get better in terms of the good innovative ideas, in terms of sharing those ideas more broadly. We need better process for processes for evaluating, evaluating ideas and allocating time and resources to try new ideas out. And I'm not going to go into this because I don't have time. I just want to let you know that uh, there's a huge amount of innovation happening in the public service, in the Electoral Commission, the, uh, the, uh, the, AB the ABS Census, the Tax Office is doing some great stuff, and there's lots of work happening in terms of internal efficiencies, procurement, document management, etc. So what I'm just going to, in my two minutes left, or one, um, we, I have a strategic centre for leadership, learning and development in my world. And essentially that's looking at what are the leadership qualities we need in the public service to be able to respond well. We're initially focusing at the very senior levels and it's work that's done under the stewardship of the Secretary's Board, which is the most senior uh, group of um, um, public servants, the, the secretaries of all the departments uh, of the public service. So under their stewardship, we're looking at what we need from leaders in the future. And, and this comes back that all of the problems and issues I described before are best classified as adaptive problems. They don't have a clear technical solution. Um, they require thinking outside traditional boundaries, discovery and experimentation. And for leaders then, and this is the model we use, it's a Harvard Kennedy School model of adaptive leadership that we use, um, is really about ensuring leaders model collaboration, have a genuine interest in and bring the best out of their people, promote learning, can use multiple frames of reference um, and can create and manage disequilibrium um, as, uh, as the tools that they, they draw on. So I'm going to stop there. I'm happy to answer any questions or what did you say, Peter?